years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good evening and welcome to the Independent Republican Mike Graham. You're with Talk, we're on TV, we're on radio, we're online and of course we're on your smart speaker as well. Coming up, 11th hour desperation from Rishi Sunak as he marches rebel Tory MPs to yet another Rwanda vote for heaven's sake while the polls predict complete electoral devastation. And breaking the internet after a series of Photoshop fails, it's Kate Middleton who's apparently been spotted in a Windsor garden centre, apparently. And we speak to the London chippy owner ordered by a Killjoy council to take down a Union Jack mural in Britain, folks. Good evening, Britain, and welcome to the Independent Republican Mike Graham, right here on Talk TV. Rishi Sunak survives another day at the office. Yes, it really is that bad. The Prince and Princess of Wales are absolutely fine. Of course they are. The BBC are in big trouble for anti-Semitism again. And why do those lefties insist on turning Lady Thatcher into the devil incarnate? This is the Independent Republican Mike Graham. Let's kickstart the week in style. The safety of Rwanda bill has returned to the House of Commons. Groan, I hear you say. MPs are voting on a series of amendments introduced by the House of Lords tonight. I'm joined now by former UKIP leader Henry Bolton. Henry, very good evening to you. Welcome back to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Uh, I've got that feeling of deja, deja vu all over again. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, it seems to be taking up half of my life, this thing. Right. Um, yeah. And I've, looked at, I've, looked, I've had a quick glance at some of these amendments, some of which are quite frankly ludicrous. One of them actually says that the new Rwanda law uh, must be enacted uh, in law and must not break the law. Now, call me old fashioned, but yeah. if you're actually bringing a new law into the Houses of Parliament, you don't need to say it must be the law because it's already become the law, hasn't it? Yeah, indeed. Uh, and this has been a, a, an argument put up against, uh, put up by those people who are against this Rwanda plan right from the beginning, um, that, you know, it's got to comply with the law. Well, you know, that's what an act of parliament is. It's the law. <laughs> exactly. Um, and, and it really is nonsensical to me. And you know, there is a... The, the bill actually says, not that it should need saying, certainly not in an act, in, act of parliament, that the parliament is sovereign. Well... You know, um, why that needs to be stated to Parliament, yeah. uh, I don't know. Um, yeah. but it, it, it might as well, it might as well say Parliament, Parliament's uh, got a big tower uh, with a bell at the top that rings every hour, uh, and it's called Big Ben. Actually, yeah, it's, not really it's, got, uh, it's, it's largely populated by Muppets, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, yeah. <laughs> but um, but th the thing is that if Parliament decides that Parliament wants to breach... Uh, some agreement that it's got internationally, not that this necessarily will, but if they decide that they want to do that, then they don't need... Then they are within the law, because Parliament is sovereign. So this whole whole idea that, you know, there is this is unlawful is, is just a red herring. Mm. It's just something to put people off supporting it, I think. Yes. Um, it's nonsensical. Yeah, I think so. I think, I think, I think a, a most, most constitutional lawyers would tell you the same thing. Yeah, and I think it's more or less just a sort of a blocking mechanism, isn't it? Um, but stay where you are, Henry. I'm joined now from the Central Lobby in Westminster by Conservative MP uh, Mark Garnier, uh, who is an MP for Wire Forest. Mark, a very good evening to you. Thanks for joining us on the Independent Republic, Mike Graham. Um, the voting, I believe, is, un is underway. What's, uh, I'm sorry to make you feel like you're being a reporter here, but uh, tell us what's happening. Uh, well, we've just had the first division bell. Uh, we are expecting 10 divisions on this, so 10 votes. Um, so each one takes about 15 minutes. So we're going to be here for, what, about two and a half hours voting Crikey. on this. Um, but there are... Um, so, so, so basically, these are all the Lord's amendments. And the government has put down uh, a motion to, to reject every single one of them. So we're not expecting any of these Lord's amendments to go through uh, unless some people rebel. But, but, I, but there's, there's no talk of rebellions on this. I think it's going to go through all fairly, fairly clearly, and that'll be the end of it. So we should end up with third reading uh, this evening or whenever, it's certainly by the end of this week. 
uh, royal assent shortly after that, and so and then straight after that we should be able to enact this this, this act of parliament, right. as it will be by the time we've finished. Yes, and, and for the people who are most interested in the end result, um, when, if possible, would it be before anybody actually gets on a plane to Rwanda? Well, if this, if this act works exactly as we wanted to do, to the, to the extent we wanted to do, actually, it will, you'll never send anybody to Rwanda because it will have had the effect of putting people off coming over the, over the English Channel. And these, the, the, these uh, illegal migrants, uh, or the, those migrants potentially gaming the system. Um, but look, inevitably, it's not going to st stop every single one of them. So from what I understand, we should start seeing, uh, seeing, seeing those failed migrants being deported to Rwanda uh, within the next, next few weeks, so mm. sort of four or five weeks or so. And these would be people who have already been turned down for asylum, presumably? Um, I will have to double check that because it may be people who have been turned down by the, by the new rounds. But if you remember, the, the, the whole of this bill is looking at trying to sort of uh, uh, speed up the process by which you can, you, can, you can deal with all of this. What we don't want to do is have endless, endless, endless uh, appeals against the, 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 the findings of a court, right. um, which is what we've seen with a lot of, uh, a lot of those, the, the, those applicants who, who yeah. appear to be gaming the system. I mean, I yeah. I'm not to do that. Well, that is the problem, isn't it? Because every single time that anybody tries to do anything different, lawyers get involved and nobody goes anywhere. Well, I think it's not unreasonable that, that if somebody comes along and, and, and claims asylum here, that they should get some sort of legal advice. But, but, but Mike, you're absolutely right. I mean, at the end of the day, if you are uh, sort of thinking about this as a package that's being offered by the illegal uh, criminal, uh, you know, people smugglers that are, that are behind all of this, you know, for eight or ten thousand dollars, you are being presented with an opportunity to be delivered to uh, the beaches of, 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 of Dover, and after that you will then be given a you know, three-star hotel accommodation for as long as it takes. You'll be given all the legal advice for as long as you want. Um, you get, I can't remember what it is, I think £4.50 a day in living expenses, which doesn't you know, even buy you half a packet of cigarettes. But nonetheless, it's taxpayers' money. You know, it, it, it actually looks quite good value for money, for eight or $10,000. Um, and obviously, it's the British taxpayer that are paying, paying for the vast majority of this. So the whole point behind this, this process is to, try to, is to try to disrupt that people smugglers' uh, business model so that people will stop coming across the English Channel. Right. So, one final one for you, Mark. Not much rebellion on the Rwanda safety bill, but what about generally the rebellion? How's the, uh, how's the atmosphere? I mean, there must be more, uh, there must be more plots than, uh, than Macbeth <laughs> right now, isn't it? Well, I mean, to be honest with you, Mike, I, I, I'm not the type that gets drawn into these plots, so nobody's ringing me to see if I would support, you know, whoever it happens to be, Penny or Rob or Suella or whatever. Um, but look, there is all this talk over the weekend, you know, we're acutely aware of this and, and we have been sort of chatting amongst ourselves to try and find out where it's coming from. Um, look, at the end of the day, it is completely insane. The idea that we're going to change for, what is it, our fourth or fifth um, new Prime Minister in this Parliament alone, you know, look, we, 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 we've got to present a united front and I've, I've said this before and I'll say it again, if we don't like ourselves, then why should the voters like us? So we've got to get behind Rishi, who, you know, I strongly believe is doing an outstanding job. Um, I think we get, get behind him, get on with the next general election and go and present the strong case that Conservatives can and, and you know, point out the failings that Labour have with their manifesto. Mark Garnier, thanks very much indeed, Conservative MP for Wire Forrester down in the lobby at the beginning of the process of uh, about, what, ten different amendments? They're going to be there for two and a half hours. Well, we finished before they are. Um, stay where you are, Henry Bolton. I'll come back to you in a second, but I want to introduce the panel now um, because I've got Madeleine Grant, I've got Lord Dodsworth and I've got Andrew Eborn here with me. They're quite a sensible Tory MP. I've not really seen much of that recently. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Tom heads to prevail and yes. not wanting a leadership contest. Right. I, yeah. I think they're actually more than you think that that, that do um, adopt that attitude, mm. frankly. I'm sure I, that's I think true. that obviously it's in the interest of journalists to big up and you never know quite where it's coming from because often it is anonymous briefing. Yeah. No one, when no one is named, it could, it could be sort of, sounds like it could be 12 MPs or it could just be one. I mean, right. we have no idea right. precisely the scale of no. the, the I mean, plotting. I guess the difficulty for Rishi Sunak is, is, is Penny Morden continues to say nothing. Yeah. Uh, like, you know, I'm not interested in taking over from Rishi Sunak. I think he's a brilliant Prime Minister. Yeah. Why, I don't know why people keep mentioning my name. She hasn't said that, has she? Has, hasn't she? No. No. Well, Kemi Badenox denied all of the plotting, hasn't yeah. she? So and that one must be true. So that, so that, <laughs> that one must be true.
true. I mean, Penny, Penny Morden <coughs> did a great job, didn't she, last year, carrying a sword? Mm, yeah. <laughs> she did. <laughs> In her new ceremonial role. Yes. But, I mean, that's about all I can think of. I, I think that she's just too sort of, can I just say, a bit, a bit too wet. And mm. I think that there'd be a real misunderstanding of what, that quite new fragile voter base and the red wall mm. really wants. I'm told she's a very good conser uh, conservative local MP though for Portsmouth. Yes, people down there really like her. Yep, you know. Mm. So I mean, she has that in her favour. But I mean, again, it's a bit of a poison chalice, isn't it, Andrew? Oh, it's yeah. total poison chalice. I mean, if somebody came to me and said, "Would you like to be leading conservative?" I would say no. Really? Okay. I, I think you'll be very good. I, well, I, I would be good, but, you know, this is not the time, Andrew. The, yeah. the, the reality is this, is that Penny hasn't turned round and said no. Right. And that's the interesting thing, because normally what people do, they turn around and they deny, of course, no, we must support the current leader and yeah. so on and so forth. It would be interesting to get, what, our fourth female prime minister yeah. uh, within that time. And they're talking about working on that sort of premise, that they're gearing up for the next sort of side. But the fact that she hasn't come out, it begs all sorts of questions. Because mm. normally what they do, and it always follows the pattern, they always deny everything. Everything. I'm right behind Rishi is yeah. what she should have said. She hasn't, so I'm sure that her political ambitions will come to the forefront eventually. Yeah, I mean, the smart money's on, let's wait and see what happens in the yeah. main local elections, isn't it? And then yeah. the plotting will really start. I think it's bad yes. now. Then it'll be really bad. Let's go back to Henry Bolton. Now, Henry, sorry to, to uh, keep you waiting there. Um, what, did no, you no make, what did you make of Mark Garnier's um, assessment of tonight? So basically what we've had is a complete and utter waste of time. The House of Lords have come up with 10 amendments, which are all going to get voted down tonight. More public money down the, down the wazoo. Um, more Lords claiming their £350 a day for coming in and debating in high dudgeon all of these things, which are going to go nowhere. Well, uh, two things uh, immediately come to mind, Mike. Uh, number one is that Mark Garnier was saying that they hope that this will deter small boat crossings. It will not. They are trying to deter the wrong people. Mm. And, you know, even on government figures, if they send 500 people over to Rwanda, if they succeed in all of that, and I'll come on to that in a minute, then um, going, you know, if, we, if we've got 40,000 people crossing the channel, that's one in 80 people. Um, and none of these people are, who are thinking of coming are going to consider that a, a risk not worth taking mm. um, in that regard. The people we need to deter are the organised criminals who are marketing the movement, encouraging it in the first place, and then facilitating it all the way through from the point of origin. Um, but the, the other thing that he, he was talking about there, um, oh, and you've just mentioned indeed, are the Ten Amendments. Well, you know, I, I'm going to slightly disagree with you, Mike. Um, That's OK. Yeah, it's the, allowed. The Lords... <laughs> the, the, <laughs> the Lords... <laughs> Thank you. Um, the Lords are, uh, yeah, they're, they're criticised for all sorts of reasons, uh, good reasons and bad. But one of the things that they are supposed to do is scrutinise legislation. And that's really their primary purpose. And if they feel that something needs to be looked at again, um, then so be it. What we've got a problem with generally with the Lords, and it's a different topic to Rwanda, I suppose, but um, is are they the right people? Are they really qualified enough and engaged enough uh, and experienced enough to be that sort of senior uh, devil's advocate and technical sort of scrutiny uh, uh, branch of parliament that we need. Uh, I would say, I would argue that's not the case. So we need to get better quality people in there and probably fewer. But um, I have no problem with this going backwards or forwards. It's, it's meant to be a quality control and I wouldn't like to see it otherwise. The other thing um, that just quickly to mention, um, you know, the, we are, and I keep saying this, whenever, whatever opportunity I have, we fixate on Rwanda. As I said just now, Rwanda is not going to solve the small boats problem, uh, but it does distract the public, the media and politicians from all of the issues relating to our borders. Our borders are insecure. They are porous. We have got all of the cocaine, all of the heroin, 97% of the firearms used in the UK in crime, or all come across our borders. Our fisheries, that, the fishery, fishery protection stuff, that is a form of border stuff. Uh, our, our, our maritime pollution controls, that's part of your border control as well at the maritime level. None of this is getting any attention, but all of it is failing just as much as the immigration yeah. side of it. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I'd like to see this opened up. Yeah. Henry, thanks very much indeed for your time. Henry Bolton there, a former UKIP leader. Um, Maddie, let's go, go back to just sort of domestic politics, if you like, you know, not so much about the borders in Rwanda, but, you know, Rishi Sunak claimed today uh, that basically the party was sort of more united than ever and this is going to be our year, were his words. I mean, is he the most deluded guy in Westminster? Well, he's, what he said was that this will be the year of the um, Tory bounce back, right. he said. I'm not sure about that. I think there's... The big worry for them now is, you know, does the 
does the lack of support, does the decline in support, does it have a kind of natural mm. um, low point? You know, yeah. is there a point at which it can it can go, go no lower? Because they keep getting to the point Every that which everyone worse, would have said, this is where the Tory right. faithful will kick in. It yeah. won't go lower than, you know, 25% mm. or whatever, and it keeps getting lower. And still there's the question mark, for example, should Nigel Farage decide to take over yes. the Reform Party um, and massively turbocharge the publicity and um, the support that they that they, ha they currently have. That mm. could also be a terminal event. But I think maybe, I think part of the reason for the PM's allegedly optimistic feeling is, is just based on the fact that, you know, we will start to see inflation going lower. Mm. You know, you could have Rwanda flights, albeit perhaps not enough to make a massive point to and say, mm. look, the medicine is working, yes. things are turning around, the economy is doing better. But people and in enough. the end, yeah, it didn't really make any difference no. to how people felt. I think the difference now is that Blair was quite an interesting kind of possibility for people, yeah. whereas Starmer isn't really, is he? I mean, he's not interesting. No, and they're not saying they've got anything interesting to do. Uh, you're right, it's, they're voting against, as opposed to something for, you're not yeah. voting for Starmer, yeah. you're voting against the choice. I don't think it's going to be as bad for them as people to make out, because the reality is it's appalling at the moment. What would you expect a leader to say? Not that I'm in a dismal position, but I'm in a really good... They're all yeah. everyone's behind me, maybe they're stabbing him. I mean, by. I would yeah. find it quite refreshing if you came out one day and just went, this is an absolute nightmare. It is. You know, my job <laughs> is the worst job. I never thought it would be this bad. I can't believe I'm still here. Um, but we'll have an election soon, I won't be here for much longer. But, but I mean, that'd what, be great, but You're absolutely right, but as always. But, but what happens, everybody's going to remember his five promises, and yeah. most of which are easy. The, the inflation bit when it was at 11%. To do I with promise him. I'm going to get it half there. Yeah. Stop the boats. Uh, Piers, will, Piers will lose his his, his £1,000 bet. There yeah. will be at least one, because he bet, Rishi, yeah. there's going to be no flights at all yeah. before the election. Right. Uh, and I think there will be at least one flight. Okay. The crazy thing is, what the FT says, is working about £230,000, £230,000 mm. per person yeah. that you sent to Rwanda, and, which is complete madness. What you need to look at, as the point was made earlier, it's supposed to be a deterrent. If we can deter people from coming over, then that's got to make sense. Yes. Oh. We've got to go. We'll come back to this in a second. Sorry. You're watching Independent Republican Mike Graham. Coming up, another day, another bonkers leadership plot in the party. And we've been talking about rebel MPs trying to topple the Prime Minister. We'll have more of that after this. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <is it? laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, 
had lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Wallowing in number 10 with no mates, it's Rishi Sunak, who is electorally screwed after Lee Anderson's defection. Plus, reports of a raft of MPs wishing to leave the party have led to knives being brandished by rebels who want the Prime Minister's head on a plate. Uh, let's bring back Maddie, Andrew and Laura Dodsworth. Uh, they're all here. We were talking before, Laura, about um, whether or not there is a thirst for a new leader at this point. There may not be a thirst for a new leader until May, but if it was to be Penny Mordaunt, you know, there's a lot of people, as you say, who think she's a bit wet, think she's a bit woke, think she's not that conservative. Tell me more. Um, I mean, there's a couple of things. In her, her leadership campaign before, it was very dull, you know, it was very pragmatic. She talked about it being about the ship, not the leader of yeah. the ship, so I'm not even sure what she's talking about. But for me, the you know one of the key litmus tests of whether somebody's fit to lead the country is can they speak basic truths? Mm. And it comes back to the gender question. Yeah. I'm like a broken record on this, but she's one of those who said that trans women are women. Yeah. She's done a bit of a volta face on this recently because that turned out that wasn't in line with what voters really want, but she's mm. been very, very woke on gender. You know, Suella Braverman said that Penny Mordaunt was one who wanted maternity legislation to be degendered and talk about pregnant people. Right. I, I think that, you know, while it'd be, sure, it'd be exciting to have another female prime minister, we want a female prime minister who knows what female means. Yes, that would be helpful. And that's the thing, the Tory party's been sort of pulled in one direction and then back into another direction. It doesn't really know, it's still got a kind of identity crisis, hasn't it, at the moment, Madeleine? Well, I say there are, you know, which Tory party? There, are, yeah. there seem to be a few. Right. And I think we've been somewhat blindsided about the, the absolutely enormous differences that exist between them, because obviously in 2019 you had the clustering effect of not only Jeremy Corbyn, mm. but also the, the Brexit fatigue and Boris Johnson was putting, promising to put an end to all of that. Yeah. And, and all of these disparate groups really came together. But it seems that there are you know, all sorts of differences. And the difficulty for the Prime Minister is trying to find a narrative where you keep one group on side without mm. offending the other. Right. And you, you could have an MP in, in, you know, in the South East or in the sort of, you know, the, the sort of Midland Shires or something, and they might be fa fa facing off against a Lib Dem. Yeah. So they will probably not love the Rwanda policy. They, they will have di different things that they want the Prime Minister to be talking about more. And then, you know, in the Red Wall, that could be something completely different. Mm. So the difficulty is, is trying to somehow weld all these groups together. Right. And is there a genuine threat from reform? I mean, will there be 10 to 12 Tory MPs who might consider actually quitting before an election? Well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that. There were rumours that um, uh, Scott Benton, um, who's the MP for Blackpool, Blackpool South, yeah. I think I want to say, yeah. um, definitely one of the Blackpool seats. And it, but that, that doesn't seem to have materialised. Mm. Um, reform have picked another, a different candidate quite sensibly, I would say. Yes. Um, there hasn't been the mass exodus post Lee Anderson. But I think in terms of... I think the big, the bigger danger is more just them eroding that uh, the Tory, um, mm. Tory, Tory majorities in every single constituency. And, you know, let's not forget that in 2019, one thing that massively helped them was the fact that Nigel Farage agreed to stand back yeah. the Brexit yeah. party in those seats. And there's actually quite a lot of very prominent people in the Labour Party who owe their existence as MPs to the fact that the Brexit party ran in these seats. Mm. People like Yvette Cooper wouldn't be in the right. House of Commons. Bridget Phillipson, the Shadow Education yeah. Secretary. Like, we forget how well they did and how much, how, how much worse for the Tories it mm. could have been without that. Absolutely. And they're definitely not going to do that this time around, I should No, think. definitely not. Just <laughs> well, before Richard we Tyson carry on. Richard Tyson made it very clear yeah. he's not going to. He's <laughs> written to everybody saying, we're not going to step aside. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and people never change their minds before. Yeah, of course not. So that must be not <laughs> going to happen. Let's look at Rishi Sunak today, though. Uh, he insisted today that he was not interested in Westminster politics, rather strangely, uh, because he said he wanted to make sure that the party was altogether behind it. Here he is um, speaking on the matter a little bit earlier. 
No, I, I'm not interested in all Westminster politics. It doesn't matter. What matters is the future of our country. And that's what I'm squarely focused on. That's what I get up every morning working as hard as I can to deliver, whether it's cutting people's taxes, increasing the state pension, today increasing the number of apprenticeships and talking to small businesses. Those are the other things that matter to people. And as we've seen over the last few weeks, our plan is working. Inflation is coming down. Wages are growing. The economy is back to growing again. Again. And if we stick to this plan, I can deliver a brighter future for everyone in our country. That's what I'm doing. Well, really? I mean, the oh. economy's growing by 0.2%, right? It still makes me cross that he was the Chancellor pre that presided over all the money printing, the yeah. furlough, and, and the disastrous economic consequences right. of lockdown. This is why we are where we, exactly. you know, why we are. Where this we is where are. the plan has got us to, Andrew. Yeah. Yes, no, you're, you're absolutely right. I think the reality is we need a leader that has very clear policies. Mm. And, and this is his... Selling point, if he keeps telling everybody that Labour has no policies, yeah. and you keep saying, look, here are my policies, this is what we're going to stand against, and forget all this silly little petty politics and people backstabbing, mm. what you need to do is think about the country. If you made people scared, it was P.T. Barnum and also the father of PR mm. who turned around and said that the best way of selling anything to people is through fear. Yeah. If you made people scared that we're on a path to recovery, and if you don't continue on this path, you're going to lose out, that's the way he could win this election. Yeah, but the trouble is, I think most people now don't believe in word that either party says, do they? I mean, that's the problem. You can, they're not even being frightened by Rishi Sunak. They just don't believe him anymore. Yeah, I mean, I, th I just think that, you know, right, so I think he, he has, he's he been very unlucky in some ways. I mean, has made mistakes, yeah. um, some mistakes on his watch, some very bad communication. But he's also slightly the victim of things beyond his control. But after all, he did want this job. You yeah. Know? And... Also, I mean, everything's always going to be outside of your control. I mean, you know, it's an event. Well, for example, yeah. right? for example, the, the Rwanda policy, um, he, he, I think he sort of felt at the time that he became Tory leader that he basically, in order to kind of show the right of his party mm. that he meant business, he had to kind of tether himself to the Rwanda policy, which was the brainchild of Boris Johnson yeah. and Priti Patel. And, I mean, obviously, the big mistake was then not showing that there was just one of many things they were trying to do yeah. and it's become the absolute focal point of migration policy yeah. um, and that was a big communications error but there are sort of things that are I, I don't think are entirely his fault but you know them's the break he, he, oh, yeah. he will so get. he's in charge yeah. and he will but have if, to take the, the rap I'm yes. afraid won't he if, if, yeah. if one plane takes off I think it is going to be a win for Rishi Sunak now whether you think it's a suitable deterrent or not um, and you know there's arguments on both sides, you know, about whether Australia's offshore uh, system has worked. I don't think that's the point. I think what any kind of casual, ordinary observer can see is that our parliamentary sovereign law is being thwarted mm. by people who use international law yeah. to try to stop something that they ideologically oppose. And that feels fundamentally unfair, wrong. It's a misuse of law. Undemocratic. It's undemocratic. Yeah. And, and that in itself is the bothersome thing. I mean, there's also the sunk cost fallacy. I mean, this by now is terrifying. Yeah. We spent 240 billion on Rwanda, million. on million, sorry, yes. on 240 million on Rwanda until the end soon, of sure. yeah. 2023. <laughs> 20, yes. But it's going to go to 370 yeah. million. Yeah. And, and nobody wants to be lost in a sunk cost fallacy. But you think, well, you know, we spent that much. Let's at least get right. one plane off the ground. Right. We spend £8 million pounds a day yeah. on yeah. asylum housing it, costs. Yeah, it's but shocking. You know what? It, it's it's insane. So if it yeah. might work as a deterrent, it's worth it. But what he would show is that he's beaten, he's beaten the blob. Yes. Mm. And I think that that would really rouse quite a lot of support yeah. in his favour. Yeah. I think you also yeah. have to look at what is happening in other places parts of Britain. You know, I read an amazing piece by Matthew Syed this weekend in the Sunday yeah. Times. He went to Rochdale, uh, got off the train, he saw six mosques within earshot of, or within sort of, you know, eyesight of the train station. There's a school opposite the train station, it's got 450 kids in it, only one of them is white. Now, you know, you can make any argument you like, but that is not the Britain that an awful lot of people are used to, and not the sort of Britain that a lot of people want to live in. And, you know, that, that's already gone. And I'm sure there are other places like Rochdale. There's also a massive, you know, problem with, with poor white underclass kids as well uh, yeah. who go to another school which is more or less completely white. You know, but there's a lot of segregation now yeah. in society, a lot of it caused by mass immigration. Well, it's the failure of multiculturalism yeah. because if you laud diversity itself as a quality right, to aspire to, sake. it is literally opposed to, to the principle yeah. of integration. It doesn't work. It, it, integration is absolutely cannot, key. It just cannot work. No, and it's been a right. huge failure. What, this what you are going to find, though, soon as going to start getting some wins on all of his five promises, I can guarantee over okay. the next few Well, will. I look forward to you uh, apologising uh, to me down the road <laughs> when that turns out to be completely. You should be doing a wager. That's talked to you. That's what they do on the show. 
show because they've got loads of money. Exactly. You know, that's not what we do here. Um, thank you very much indeed, uh, uh, Madeline and Laura, and of course, Andrew. We'll have you all back very shortly. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham, the Princess of Wales, has been spotted out in public. But will it do anything to silence the speculation? More on this coming up. Don't go anywhere. Very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't Talk. going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat, go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. You might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <Where is> it? <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square because you've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. We're supposed to, supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. This is Talk TV. For weeks, the question at the front of everyone's minds has been, where is Kate? While the rumour mill continues to churn out a never-ending stream of ridiculous theories, it appears the Princess of Wales has come out of the shadows. According to The Sun, Kate has been seen in public for the first time since undergoing abdominal surgery. And you saw, of course, the front page uh, of The Sun this morning, in which it basically said that she had been spotted um, going out and about at a farm shop in Windsor. Now, we may have some news for you, uh, figuring out exactly where that goes, because people said, after The Sun published that, well, where's the picture? Where on earth is the picture of Kate? And why have we not seen it? And why would The Sun publish a story saying that she's been seen out and about, but they wouldn't take a picture? But the thing about the way that The Sun operates is that The Sun will be probably looking for that picture, and then they'll make a decision about whether to publish that picture. Uh, because, of course, at the moment, some of the phone calls I've been getting personally from the United States of America in particular have been un unbelievable. Piers Morgan said today that he's been getting more uh, calls from the US of A about this and about the Kate situation than he got when the Queen actually died. Because, of course, for all those people who say, oh, you must leave them alone, you mustn't allow them to in any way uh, have to tell you what they're doing, they don't have to reveal what it is that's going on uh, inside their own health, inside their own personal lives, they don't have to do it. But the bottom line is, unfortunately, we're not talking about 
shy and retiring individuals. We're talking about the future king and queen of this country. And so, tonight, The Sun, in an incredible exclusive, has actually got some video footage. We can look at it now, because here it is. This is the footage from the shop with uh, Kate and Prince William. Uh, you can see clearly that they're both walking down to the side of the street. She's carrying a bag. She's walking quite briskly, as you can see, which would suggest that there's nothing wrong with her. She does look a little bit thinner than perhaps the last time you've seen her, but that's hardly surprising since she's undergone a quite a serious operation. But you can see her there. This is a very, very, very big exclusive by The Sun here. This is footage that was obtained by people who saw her yesterday. It was published this morning that she was seen. And now there is the footage there. Now, is there any chance that that will stop some of these crazy stories that have been coming and emanating from social media, particularly over in the United States of America? Well, we've got the lady here to ask that very question too, because joining me now to talk about all of these things, including that latest exclusive footage from The Sun, Kinsey Schofield, host of the To Die For podcast. Kinsey, welcome to the Independent Republican Microphone once more. Uh, happy Monday to you. Um, now... Thanks. You've seen that for the first time, literally seconds after I did. Um, tell me what you think of it. Tell me what you make of it. Well, we did hear over the weekend, there was an article in the Times that yeah, clearly the Prince and Princess of Wales gave some close friends permission to talk to this reporter. Um, and one of the things that stood out to me was this quote about Prince William finding it especially challenging, all of this attention, and feeling that the couple's bubble is coming under threat. And then you see pictures of them in a parking lot, and you see video of them in a parking lot a mile away from their home and you realize their bubble truly is coming under threat. And this is, was, is exactly what I was concerned about with all the social media speculation, uh, that, 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 that privacy that they worked so hard to build around them and for their children and their family uh, around Windsor was going to be jeopardized because of somebody wanting attention online. Exactly right. But it has been getting to ridiculous proportions. I mean, I don't know if you've noticed it, Kinsey, but I particularly have. I mean, obviously, I've got family over there. Uh, I've got a lot of friends in the United States and people who you wouldn't normally expect to be minutely interested in, in the ins and outs of, of the life of, of Kate and William have been sort of you know, texting me, sending me WhatsApp messages, what's going on, how is this happening, what the hell is going to be next and all of that. I'm hoping that this piece of footage that we've just seen um, will lay all of that to waste, won't it? Absolutely. I'd like for my ex-boyfriend's roommates to stop sending me text messages <laughs> asking about the Princess of Wales. We, we no longer communicate with each other. I don't understand why you think you have that permission to do that. But here in the state specifically, Catherine's net favorability rating among Americans continues to dominate. You know, she's plus 37 points yeah. um, versus Meghan Markle's plus eight. So the American media and American public is very much enamored with this woman. Um, Double the almost triple the articles written about her within the states than uh, Donald Trump or Joe Biden combined. Um, so there is real interest within them. Where I find it appalling okay. and gross is when you turn that interest and concern into some of these kind of gutter rumors that I'm having to address on a lot of these, um, you know, international stations and here in the United States. They want to go into some of those ugly rumors. Exactly right. And I mean, one of the things I think that people misunderstand about the way that all of this stuff happens is that if the royal family says something is going to be the case, then that's entirely within their purview to continue to keep that. I think the mistake that they made, though, was that uh, Mother's Day photograph. I mean, if they hadn't done that, we wouldn't really be where we are. I mean, there would have been some low-level kind of, you know, bitching and moaning on, on Twitter, as there always is. But it wouldn't have become the thing that a big sort of American... You know, all big American TV news networks were carrying this stuff, weren't they? I think that you're exactly right. And by all accounts, that was a last minute decision. That was not a strategized execution. So you see that in the results, the messy results of that photo. Uh, all of Catherine's friends that have spoken to media uh, under the radar have said, 
that was, you know, a, a, with good intention, she wanted to surprise the world with a, a, a sweet new photo. Um, but you know, I, Mike, I just want to stress to people, the, the Prince and the Prince of Wales has been through this before. Prince William saw the media and the public turn on his grandmother after they held the children back after the death of Princess Diana and chose to grieve in private for a few days, uh, refused to lower the flag. You know, he saw the uproar that happened around his grandmother, Queen Elizabeth II. And he also saw them forgive his grandmother. And he also came out to defend her later and say, we really needed that time as a family to be alone. So he's seen that kind of the roller coaster. And he knows that while people might be upset about the lack of transparency, ultimately, they will forgive him and his wife because they absolutely adore them. Right. I mean, I hope that this does put an end to all the speculation. I really hope that people, you know, start to calm down a little bit. But what I've been saying doesn't change, that, you know, that was a very odd thing that happened over uh, Mother's Day weekend, and it probably was a mistake. And, you know, perhaps that one day they will address that. Well, there's already stories being written that, uh, that Kate may make some kind of speech at some point, uh, possibly just before Easter. She may say something at the birthday of one of her children. You know, they may issue a statement of some kind. But what I hope doesn't happen is that people look at that footage that we've just shown from the Sun newspaper tomorrow and then say, oh, she doesn't look very well or, oh, she looks a bit thin, you know, because obviously if she's recovering from surgery, she's going to look as if, you know, she's not perhaps glammed up to the nines. Correct. I mean, we're going to see that speculation because, uh, you know, what, even with what we saw with Russia, Russian media over the last 24 hours, there is a real morbid curiosity surrounding this family right now. And people want the extreme. Uh, they want bad news. They want to keep the, this story going because it's become an addiction to, to some of them. Mm. So unfortunately, that conversation is not, it, the conversation is going to happen online. People are mean spirited there. But but I do think what we, I mean, we've heard she's she's recovering very well. We can look forward to seeing her as soon as Easter. And, you know, her, while she was upset about the, the fallout uh, regarding the photo, she's in good spirits when it comes to her recovery. Yeah, absolutely right. And meanwhile, uh, King Charles, similarly, is determined to, to get back to work as normal. And he's saying that he's going to attend the Trooping of the Colour in June, despite uh, his own ongoing treatment for cancer. It may well be... Um, that he's not able to to be on a horse back or, or, or he may have to ride in a carriage. But, I mean, it would be great to see him. Absolutely. And I think that it's great that we're already talking about this, planning for it and looking forward to this event. It's one of my favourites. Um, I mean, especially over in the States, we love the pomp and ceremony. We love seeing the king on horseback. It's, I mean, it really gives him such... Um, it's, it's a handsome look, obviously. It's a, it's a look of leadership. And I, if we see him in a carriage, so be it, because I do believe it's best that they listen to their doc the doctor's advice. Uh, and But we also got kind of got used to seeing the queen in, mm. in her carriage. So yeah. I don't think it's going to make anybody think any less of him if, if he doesn't get on horseback. But obviously, uh, we do love the pomp and ceremony when it comes to big events like Trooping the Colour. Yeah, absolutely right. And finally, um, another book out, Sally Bedell Smith claiming that Meghan Markle is as narcissistic, controlling and dominating as Wallace Simpson. Um, I don't suppose terribly many people will be surprised to hear that. Yeah, Sally Bedell Smith, who's uh, met the king several times she's met princess diana as well she associated uh, you know within in these very tight little elite circles mm. so i always get a kick out of seeing what she has to say i am not um a psychologist i can't diagnose Meghan markle but i'm certainly uh, interested in, in listening to more of sally's commentary when it comes to um, Meghan's attitude i think the real Real strength in her argument is that both Edward and Harry are pretty weak individuals that allow the women to wear the pants in the family, and that is something I can absolutely agree with. Yeah, absolutely right. I mean, I guess it's too soon to know as well, but I wondered how the, um, the new venture was going. Have you ordered any uh, jam from Megan yet? I, I saw the funniest comment about the name American Riviera Orchard. Somebody right. said, this sounds like a senior living facility and I have I, I can't get it out of my head. It that is exactly it really does. what it sounds well, like. Well, you know, I, I've, I've known um, America as a country. It's sort of my adopted home. I've never heard 
of uh, the, that California coast there being referred to as American Riviera. Maybe I'm just out of touch with, with the trends, but I, nobody, when I used to go to Santa Barbara quite regularly, I used to go to LA a lot, nobody ever referred to it as the American Riviera. No, I've never heard of it referred to as that either. But, you know, she's... I, I just think it's such a pretentious name. When you look at Gwyneth Paltrow's brand Goop, it's mm. almost silly and fun to say. And it's just not what you expect from such a beautiful woman. Um, and so I just, I think that the name is so pretentious, especially when you think about the fact that Meghan Markle wrote Congress telling yeah. them that she was the girl that ate at the five $4.99 salad bar at Sizzler. It's like, what? Who are you? <laughs> I know, I know. The hits just keep on coming. Kinsey, great to see you as ever. Thank you very much indeed. Kinsey Schofield, host of the To Die For podcast there with her take uh, on this newly released footage, which we have re exclusively revealed to you here on the Independent Republic of Mike Graham from the Sun newspaper. A great exclusive from them. We'll bring you more... More on that uh, with the panel a little bit later on. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Coming up after the break, more BBC blunders and an award-winning fish and chip shop that's been ordered to remove a union flag mural. You'll find out why after the break. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have was moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Now it's time for Taking the Mic. It will soon be six months since the dreadful events of October the 7th plunged the Middle East into its worst state of instability for decades. The brutal and horrific attacks by Hamas on that fateful day were condemned by everyone who had an ounce of humanity. But of course, there were a few notable exceptions. Some of them were where you would expect them to be. 
Who can forget the crowds of men gathered in Gaza as the terrorists returned from their raid on a music festival and a peace-loving kibbutz with their treasure, half-naked young women in the back of pickup trucks, their bodies twisted and injured from the brutal assaults on them? Who can forget those same crowds cheering, chanting and spitting on the bodies of the young women as they were paraded in the streets? There were similarly cheers in Lebanon, in Syria and in Iran. These were the same places where there were cheers and celebrations when 9-11 happened and thousands of innocent people were killed in New York when the terrorists flew planes into buildings. One place where you might not expect that reaction, though, is the BBC. That's the British Broadcasting Corporation, an organisation that is sadly now so lost that it is regularly accused of anti-Semitism. Today, I'm afraid, is no exception, because a Tory MP is calling for two journalists to be suspended because they shared anti-Israel posts and liked videos praising the Hamas attacks. We've reported on these two BBC Arabic journalists before. Marie Jose al Azi described Israel as a terrorist state in a now-deleted tweet, and Soha Ibrahim liked a post on social media on October the 7th, which celebrated, in their words, the first of the martyrs of the operation. She also liked video images of people dancing and waving Palestinian flags in Lebanon and Tunisia, and even Egyptian football fans chanting, we sacrifice our souls and our blood for Palestine. Ibrahim, based in London, has been working for the BBC for 12 years. I wonder if she's ever been on any pro-Palestine marches, which of course would be pretty ironic, given that the BBC actually asked its own staff not to attend an anti-Semitism vigil in the capital a couple of months ago. Al-Azi is based in Lebanon and has posted anti-Israeli tweets since before she worked there in 2019. Well, now Nicola Richards, Tory MP for West Bromwich East and an officer for the Conservative Friends of Israel, has called for both of them to be suspended while the BBC investigates. Though quite what they need to investigate isn't very clear and why they haven't already been suspended is quite baffling. All of this comes only a few weeks after a BBC Three producer was fired when a string of hate-filled and anti-Semitic Facebook posts was uncovered. And it is set against the background of Jewish employees saying that they feel uncomfortable even going into work at the BBC now. Jeremy Bowen, the once respected chief foreign correspondent, is on record for saying he didn't regret a report in which he wrongly accused Israel of bombing a hospital in Gaza, even though it had the effect of triggering anti-Semitism around the world. And of course, John Simpson, their senior reporter still says the BBC is completely correct not to call Hamas a terrorist organisation. The BBC still has a duty to report the truth, not propaganda. These two journalists have no business being there. And now... In a classic piece of council jobs worth nitpicking, the Royal Borough of Greenwich has ordered 65-year-old owner Chris Canese to take down a patriotic mural at his shop of a cartoon fish with the Union flag waving in the air. The decision has come because his shop is apparently in a conservation area. But we know councils don't always do things for the reasons they say, don't we? Owner Chris Canzini spoke to our own Ollie Whitfield Mircic, saying he's going to take the council to task and fight the good fight. It's been a big hit because customers used to stand against this wall or in front of the shop taking pictures. Now they've got a better picture behind them and they love it. And uh, it's been about just over a month and all of a sudden the council turns up for something as innocent as this. Allegedly we need uh, planning permission. You've told the council that you're going to paint it back to a white wall. Uh -huh. When are you going to do that? Eventually. Well, I'll tell the council right now, I'm going to stretch it out as long as possible. I've got solicitors ringing me up. I've got uh, planning officers ringing me up, ex-solicitors, ex-planning officers. They are giving me free advice, free <laughs> whatever support I need. So the fight's not over yet? Then. Oh, no, 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 no. The fight is not over by, by any means, any means. Um, it's a shame. Greenwich Borough Council has told us that the issue isn't to do with the fact that the mural's got a union flag on it. It's because you're in a conservation area next to a World Heritage site and that you needed to have an application in for an advert. But they said a few people complained 
about it, quite a few people, and I have not come across one person that complains. British Heritage Site, oh, okay, British Heritage Site. Uh, this is not a listed building. Listed buildings are further down, but it's a conservation area anyway. Uh, so, allegedly, you need planning permission for this. Everyone goes past here, smiling at it. It just cheers people up first thing in the morning, adds a little bit more character to a touristic area. There'll be some people who watch this who support you, who say that your mural should stand, but there'll be others that say, if I've got to abide by the rules in a conservation area and I've got to make sure that I'm following the law, then why shouldn't Chris? This is not breaking any particular law. This is such an innocent thing. It doesn't say anything about Golden Chippy. This is a celebration of British fish and chips, and if you like, the Union Jack. It's just a celebration. It's not offending anybody. Unbelievable. It's absolutely unbelievable to say that a lot of people have been complaining. It's just not true. People yesterday, when it kicked off, I've had so many people just coming in and saying, we are behind you, we are behind you, we are behind you. I've had so many phone calls all the way from Perth in Scotland, everywhere. I had one lady from Canada ringing me up yesterday for support. This isn't the first time that you've had issues with the council. Back in 2016, you erected a 17-foot sign outside the front of your fish and chip shop, and ultimately, you had to take that down. Haven't you learned from the first time that you had issues with the council? No, that was acceptable. That was acceptable. I should have applied for planning permission. But this, it took one hour for him to paint it. So you cannot compare that with this one. So why do you think the council is taking this action then? All I can say to the council is, rather than wasting money chasing after things like that, they should be sorting out them potholes in the road that's been there for two years. When a big lorry goes by, the whole road shakes like an earthquake. So, a flag causes a problem in Greenwich. We'll talk more about that with the uh, panel when they come back, of course. I've just been told, by the way, that the first three House of Lords amendments have already been voted down uh, in the House of Commons, but there's still seven to go. We'll keep you updated with that as we go. You're watching The Independent Republic, Mike Graham. Coming up, I've got a whack for the vile v and Museum who have likened Margaret Thatcher to Hitler and Bin Laden. And speaking of disgusting behaviour, we'll have more on this wild brawl in Turkish football. See you after the break. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans 
sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you've got> to <laughs> 40 yeah. minutes, 40. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to was moved another on from that. era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good evening, and welcome to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Loads of money. Uh, you're with Talk on TV, on radio, online, and of course on your smart speaker. Coming up, Democrats are so terrified of a Trump presidential victory, they're weaponizing semantics in the poor attempt to maintain their grip on power. Blood path. Plus, Just Stop Oil face a major threat to their protest from the appeal court today, thank the Lord. And we live in upside down Britain, where former Labour MP and current V&A boss thinks Maggie Thatcher and Osama bin Laden are one and the same in a new nonsense exhibition. There was a certain inevitability about it, wasn't there? After years and years of lefty propaganda and the 11 years since her death, the vilification of Margaret Thatcher is now complete. How do we know? Today's news at the Victoria and Albert Museum has allowed an exhibition to list the former Tory Prime Minister alongside Adolf Hitler and Osama bin Laden as, in their words, contemporary villains. I shouldn't even have to explain why this is a gross slur on a woman who was elected three times to the highest office in the land. And this ghastly view comes from the very same Victoria and Albert Museum that is funded to the tune of nearly £70 million by you and I, the humble taxpayer. But perhaps we shouldn't be so surprised. Let's not forget there were people crass and ghastly enough to line Lady Thatcher's funeral route to boo and protest as her coffin drove past in a carriage. Add to that the weaponisation of senior by senior Labour Party figures of hatred towards one of our greatest Prime Ministers. Add to that endless BBC lefty comedians relentlessly making bad taste jokes about it. It was only a matter of time before one of our historic institutions would adapt that particular world view. Let's not forget, it was Jeremy Corbyn's shadow chancellor, John McDonnell, who had to apologise after saying he would like to have been able to go back in time and assassinate her in the 1980s. It will come as no surprise that the guy running the VNA is himself a former Labour MP. He is actually none other than Tristram Hunt, former Shadow Secretary of State for Education under Ed Miliband. And make no mistake, this guy is a champagne socialist, champagne socialist. So, of course, he will hate Thatcher because he has to. Educated at the exclusive all-boys private school, University College London, and then Trinity College Cambridge, of course, he went on to join the Labour Party before becoming a regular columnist for The Guardian and The Observer. I mean, you really couldn't make this stuff up. The truth about Margaret Thatcher was that she transformed Great Britain from a lacklustre, strike-riven backwater into a market-driven, competitive land of opportunity. She did for Britain what Ronald Reagan did for America. She gave people hope. She improved social mobility. And she made it possible for people who had never previously dreamed of it to own their own homes. Only the worst kind of hateful socialist would fail to recognise her place in history. Most of those who now vilify her did not live through what existed before her. And I did. And I can tell you, it was bloody awful. And let's not forget what she did for the world as well. Before Thatcher, there was a Cold War and the threat of nuclear war. After Thatcher, thanks to her alliance with America, the Soviet Union was no more. We in Britain have much to thank her for, and Mr Hunt and the V&A should be ashamed of themselves. Later in the show, we'll be bringing you a first look at tomorrow's front pages. But before anyone else, we've got an exclusive look 
at the Metro newspaper, uh, which appears to be celebrity 16-8 fast doubles risk of dying. Now, this is one of the latest fads, I suppose, which people are taking up in an effort to lose weight. Um, you eat for so long and then you don't eat for an even longer period. I don't know much about the 16-8 fast, as you can see. Uh, but obviously, if it doubles the risk of dying, I'm not interested. So thanks very much um, indeed. We'll come back to you with more on that and, of course, more on that incredible world exclusive from The Sun, uh, which features video footage uh, of Prince William and Princess Kate shopping at the Windsor Farm Shop yesterday. Now, let's go across the water, because Donald Trump's been accused of wanting another January the 6th by Joe Biden's campaign after the former president warned there would be a bloodbath if he loses the upcoming US election. But, of course, Trump has defended the warning, made at a rally in Ohio on Saturday, insisting that it was only referring to the US auto industry. Let's take a listen to what he said. If you're listening, President Xi, and you and I are friends, but he understands the way I deal, those big monster car manufacturing plants that you're building in Mexico right now, and you think you're going to get that, you're going to not hire Americans, and you're going to sell the cars to us now, we're going to put a 100% tariff on every single car that comes across the line, and you're not going to be able to sell those cars. If I get elected, now, if I don't get elected, it's going to be a bloodbath for the whole... That's going to be the least of it. It's going to be a bloodbath for the country. That'll be the least of it. And, of course, that comes as Trump also made claims that Vladimir Putin was probably involved in the death of opposition leader Alexei Navalny. Uh, this was after Putin, of course, claimed a landslide victory in Russia's presidential vote, getting a pretty big proportion of the vote, as you would expect. Joining me now, though, Fox News contributor uh, Tommy Lahren. Tommy, very good evening to you. Welcome back to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. These Democrats, I think, are certifiably insane. I've been watching all sorts of footage today um, of coverage from NBC, from MSNBC, from CNN. Um, I've also seen some very interesting footage which has been provided um, by supporters of Donald Trump uh, in which the word bloodbath is used relentlessly by the left to talk about elections all the time. And now suddenly they're worried about the word bloodbath. Yeah, this is the tactic that they must use because they don't have anything else to run on. They don't want to run on their candidate, Joe Biden. They don't want to run on his economy, his agenda, his record. What Democrats at large have done to our country, that doesn't appeal to the American voter. So they have to run on their old favorite, which is Donald Trump is deplorable. Donald Trump seeks political revenge. Donald Trump uses words we don't like because that's all they have in their toolbox. It's quite obvious they took his comments out of context. It's quite obvious that they're using it and spinning it and putting it out to low information viewers and voters and making it out to be fact. But this is nothing new. This goes back to all of the claims they've made about his comments in Charlottesville, where they took those out of context, where they claim Russia, 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 January 6th, of course, indictment one, two, three, four. This is all they have against Donald Trump. And they fear that if they were to actually air his comments in totality and in context, that people would agree with him. So they won't do that. But I think the most egregious part of all of this, it's not just the media that's played along with this, but our very own White House, which is supposed to represent the American people at large, has put out these false claims, this edited, small context version, and they're trying to pass it off as truth. That should not come from the office of the president, no matter if the president is running for re-election or not. Yeah, I mean, even Piers Morgan, you know, um, he's, he's, who's here at Talk TV, has never been um, a slavish supporter of Donald Trump. But he's written his column in the New York Post tonight, basically saying, you know, you'd think the Democrats would have learned from what happened last time. But it seems that they haven't. Uh, he said, you know, you can't believe how easily that Donald Trump can still wind these people up to use a British phrase, because it's almost as though he knows what's going to happen when he says what he says, and all of his supporters know what he's saying, and they willfully and deliberately misinterpret it. Yeah, of course they do. And listen, the, the folks out there that are editing this, that are taking it out of context, they know how dishonest and morally bankrupt they are by doing it. They simply just don't care. They seek to sow division amongst the American people. They don't want unity. They don't want to have uh, prosperity or peaceful elections. They want to sow, sow the seeds of mayhem and they want to pin it on Donald Trump, just as they did with January 6th, after they kick him off social media. He says, peacefully and patriotically, let your voices be 
heard. They conveniently forget that part of it. More and more lies about January 6th itself coming out on almost a monthly basis at this point. But the Democrats, they simply do not care. It's also called Trump derangement syndrome. They're yes. quite frankly obsessed with Donald Trump. And maybe they should take their medication. Yeah, maybe they really should. Because at the end of the day, you know, they tried to justify it, didn't they? Some of these CNBC characters were trying to justify what they'd said and what they'd tweeted out by saying he knew what he was doing, he said it deliberately, he deliberately made it vague, you know, as if they were trying to cover their tracks. But they were deleting tweets right, left and centre. As they should. You know, what they really should do is apologize. But unfortunately, we're never going to see the day where the mainstream media or the White House is going to apologize for misleading and lying to the American people. But again, Donald Trump is quite deliberate with the way that he speaks. He doesn't need to speak in coded language. He's very honest and genuine and forthright, whether you like it or not. So if Donald Trump says he was referring to it as an economic bloodbath, that's what he means. He stands by what he says, but he's not going to let the media and the White House mislead the American people. Everybody that watches the full context, knows exactly what he was talking about. It's really shameful that the left has to play these games, but maybe I don't blame them. If I was uh, this low in the approval ratings with my current candidate, maybe I would be doing the same. Unfortunately for them, I don't think it's going to work. The American people are simply not that stupid. No, exactly right. What about this other story about the bond that, that Donald Trump is going to have to put up for this ridiculous and crazy case in New York City? I can't believe most of what I now read uh, in American media, so I'm going to ask you, Tommy, to give us the lowdown on exactly what the situation is because, you know, there are those who are saying, oh, well, of course, you know, he can't afford to put the bond up, so therefore there's going to be a big problem. I doubt that that's the case. What, what's the story? Well, listen, this is all preposterous. And the fact that they are attacking him in this way and attempting to bankrupt him, I mean, that's really what they have done with all of this lawfare, all this political prosecution, and in my opinion, persecution against Donald Trump has been to accomplish two things. It's been to bankrupt him, which they're trying to do financially, and also just to really run his name through the mud and give the perception and the appearance that he's a criminal or a bad man. And unfortunately, their strategy in the minds of some Americans is working because they're missing leading the American public on a daily basis. You've got somebody who is a billionaire businessman, who has run businesses, who has contributed greatly to his community, to this country, to this economy, and all they can do is to go after him for this hush money payment and, and all of this that they're trying to do against him, this political lawfare. You know, it's really a disgrace to someone who believes in the American justice system. Unfortunately, when it comes to Donald Trump, there's certainly a, a two-tier system of justice, but he's going to keep fighting. The American people are behind him. And if there's one man that can shoulder all of this, it's Donald Trump. Absolutely right. And meanwhile, uh, he's on uh, Truth Social tonight, or this afternoon in your case, um, calling for a debate uh, with crooked Joe Biden. You know, sleepy, creepy, Beijing Joe Biden. You know, but Biden is running scared of him, isn't he? There's no way he's going to debate him. There's no way that Joe Biden can even answer questions from the press. And we see it time and time again. He says he doesn't believe he's allowed to take questions. He's asking whatever arbitrary ruler he has over him if he can take questions. And when he does, it has to be from a pre-selected group of people with pre-selected questions. Unfortunately, debates don't work that way. You know, I believe he performed badly leading up to 2020, but it's only, you know, up to your imagination how he would perform in 2024 given his cognitive decline. They will keep putting him in the basement, whether he likes it or not, and they will only run on Donald Trump is bad. I don't expect to be a Joe Biden debate, but I don't also expect Joe Biden to be the nominee. So that's the curveball that's going to be thrown into all of this. Just wait till the convention. Yeah. What's your, who's your money on for the convention surprise? Do you think it's going to be um, somebody who's currently a governor? Uh, do you think it's going to be somebody from left field? Because I'll tell you what was funny today. I don't know if you saw this. Barack Obama suddenly turned up in Downing Street for a private meeting with our Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. Yeah, well, there are many of us who believe that Obama is still running a shadow government, but I don't think it's going to be an Obama that's going to step into the role of the nominee. Uh, I quite frankly think it's going to be California Governor Gavin Newsom, who is yeah. already also running a shadow campaign. It's going to come down to the convention or shortly thereafter. They simply cannot run with Joe because Joe cannot speak. Joe cannot conduct himself in a way that's even, you know, indicative of having a pulse. Yeah. So I believe it's going to be California Governor Gavin Newsom, but not until the convention or shortly thereafter. Right. And let's talk Talk a little bit about Gavin Newsom because our viewers might not know too much about California, but I've got a son that lives in Long Beach, California, so I know exactly how much he has ruined that particular, you know, sort of um, metropolitan area of Los Angeles there. It's an absolute hellhole, isn't it? 
Yeah, it is. You know, I lived in L.A. for several years, and I got to tell you, it's really embarrassing when the fifth largest economy in the entire world, being California, is struggling the way it's struggling with homelessness, with taxes, with regulation, yeah. with the mass exodus of Americans that are leaving perhaps one of the most beautiful places in the world to go to other states simply because they cannot afford it. California Governor Gavin Newsom has run that state into the ground. It's also an entire sanctuary state for illegals and illegal immigration. Yeah. He simply cannot manage his own state, let alone our entire country. So folks, let California be a cautionary tale. You do not want to California your America. No, exactly right. And just one final thing, uh, Tommy, before I let you go. We've managed to get from The Sun exclusively tonight uh, some pictures, a video uh, of Princess Kate uh, with her husband, Prince William, uh, out and about shopping. You know, we get more and more questions over here all the time from the US of A. I mean, it's been an incredible story, but it's been incredibly uh, ridiculous as well. Here's the video right here. Uh, you can see her quite clearly walking uh, with a bag. She seems to be walking pretty briskly. She looks OK. If she's a little bit thinner, that wouldn't be that surprising. But that's her and her husband, William. Hopefully, this puts an end to all this crazy social media witch hunting that's been going on. Yeah, I certainly hope the obsession uh, is over. I know a lot of Americans are very invested in the royal family, and they feel very close to the royal family for whatever reason. But I think everyone loves a good conspiracy theory. I hope that this puts an end to it. I hope that, you know, everybody can look back at this photo editing scandal and realize it was much ado about nothing. Let's move on. She appears to be fine. We're wishing for her health and for her happiness. But I think it's time to move on. I hope this settles it. Yeah, I would hope so too, Tommy. Great to see you. Thank you very much indeed. Tommy Lauren there, talking a great deal of sense uh, from the US of A, not only on uh, Princess Kate, but also, of course, on Donald Trump, on Joe Biden. And who is likely to be the Democrat nominee? Because it probably won't be uh, Sleepy Creepy Joe. Now, if you thought hooliganism only existed on home ground, think again, because after a dramatic defeat last night, fans of Turkey's Trabzon sport football team stormed the pitch and started brawling with security forces and players from visiting Fenerbahce, who had just won the game 3-2 in the 87th minute. Take a look at this. You've never seen anything like it. And as they start invading the pitch, you'll see um, various players trying to walk away, various players trying to get out of the way, because in Turkey, temperatures run very, very high. Tempers run very high, of course, as well. At one point, you see a footballer trying to do a kind of a roundhouse kick at the, uh, at the on marauding fan who seems to be running towards him. It's the most extraordinary thing you've ever seen. I've spoken to many uh, British players who've gone out and played out there, and it literally is like the cauldron of hate you know, they talk about cultures of hate, but this one really is. Whenever you go to a big Turkish kind of local derby or where tempers are running high, it is absolutely incredible what goes on. And where you have the fans not only attacking the, the, the players, but you have the players attacking the fans as well. It's called Fight Club Turkish style. I mean, football's got some problems in this country, but I don't think it's quite as bad as that. Now, you're watching The Independent Republican Mike Graham. Next, my panel returns to discuss, to discuss the day's news, including the gross overspending at City Hall under, you guessed it, Sadiq Khan's watch. We'll be back shortly. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Hey, Quite hey. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. 
I might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! <laughs> it's carry on. What just happened? <laughs> Whoa, listen. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did the fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to was have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Telegraph columnist Maddie Grant, author and journalist Laura Dosworth, and barrister and broadcaster Andrew Ebor. Not technically still with me because I've only just come back, but uh, welcome. Thank you very much indeed uh, for all of that. Now, uh, we've got loads to talk about because uh, we've got to kick off, surely, uh, the story of the day the Victorian Albert Museum. Yes. Um, and the disgraceful manoeuvre by uh, Tristram Hunt who's not as woke as you might think, because apparently he did actually stand up to the gender Nazis a little while ago. But he decided it was a great idea to put on uh, an exhibition of what was comedy, but they didn't do it right. Because, I mean, I've said earlier on that, the, that they've, they've linked Margaret Thatcher in with, you know, villains, contemporaneous villains, like Osama bin Laden and Hitler. But they're not really villains, are they? They're actually mass killers. Yeah. So, you know, here we have, as usual, the left kind of demonising Margaret Thatcher, which mm. they can't seem to get enough of doing. Mm. And I said in my little monologue about her that she completely changed Britain. A lot of people who now hate Margaret Thatcher weren't alive when she was around and certainly weren't alive before she was around because Britain, before she came into power in 1979, was not a very nice place to live. Uh, yeah, there's many times I wish we had clones of Margaret Thatcher yeah. to, uh, to take the helm again. I mean, it's just it's just a a caricature dummy of her. Is it? Is it from Spitty Image? It's from Spitty Image, and it's yeah. with some kind of Punch and Judy characters right. and the rest of it. But what they did was they linked her in the same sentence with Osama bin Laden yeah. and Adolf Hitler, which is it's a little beyond the pale. Yes. You know, that's what's really objectionable. Mm. The thing is, um, the v does seem to have a bit of an issue with Margaret Thatcher. They do. Because in the past, her family offered her complete yeah. wardrobe, including wedding dress. Yes. And they turned it down because they said they don't want clothes uh, for social and cultural reasons, only for the aesthetic value, mm. which, of course, makes no sense at all because aesthetic That'd be why values did David Bowie, are always, uh, are always uh, completely exhibition. linked to yeah. social yeah. and cultural values. Why is, why is um, the Princess Diana of Wales' wedding dress more aesthetically valuable than... Margaret Thatcher's wedding yeah. dress. I know some people have clever answers to that, but anyway, it, it was obviously about an no, ideological... It's ideology. It's ideological, isn't it? ...disposition. And the thing is that, you know, you just get the sense that what underpins all of this with these museums is a kind of a wokeness that's crept in. You know, it's in the National Trust slavery exhibitions, um, it's in the National Maritime Museum's recent Queer History Night where they yeah. tried to queer Admiral Nelson, which is just ridiculous <laughs> for such a vigorously heterosexual man. And... <laughs> You know, it was in 2022, the International Council of Museums mm. changed the definition of a museum. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying the change of definition of museum is what's created the change in all the museums and art galleries, but it's all kind of linking it. There's this underpinning wokeness. Mm. And for the first time, museums are defined by using words like um, ethics and yeah. sustainability and inclusivity, mm. yeah. which is not really what we thought of museums no. as, as being about. And we've seen the British Museum, haven't we, have this terrible kind of self 
a navel gazing episode where we were going to give all the stuff back yeah. and take it all out of the museum and send it back to the wherever it, they it got is it is extraordinary. I mean, what's the point of having a museum if you can't have stuff no, you're from elsewhere? You're mm. what, what, what's interesting as well about this, though, Mike, is that the stories really come about as a result of what's been written at yes. the exhibition rather than the exhibition itself. So what I did in the interest of researching this programme, I went to the V&A today. And I oh, had totally a look. got pictures of you going. Oh, ah, look at me. I've been there. There there you are. Are. There's, there's me in front of all uh, Mussolini and, uh, and, and other bits and pieces. Right. There's also me in front of Maggie Thatcher. Yes. Uh, which, which we've got over here as well. And what they're trying to do is say, look, contemporary, this is what they do. You that's me the original. That's a long time ago. That's me with Maggie Thatcher. Is that you the on the left there? That's, that's uh, me on the left here the first time. Left Lady Maggie Thatcher. Thatcher. Everybody's when on the left. When was that picture Maggie. taken? Um, oh, a couple of years ago. Yeah. <laughs> but this is what I used to work for, uh, Dentsu. And the big Japanese advertising agency. So if you ever saw Lost in Translation, yeah. that was all about taking the big stars to Japan to do advertising campaigns. Yes. And so we took Maggie Thatcher. Mm. And you took Maggie Thatcher, you got Jeffrey Archer for free, right. um, which was interesting. Yes. Um, I Lots of people went to Japan to do adverts that they would never do. Exactly. At so home, I did Stephen right? Hawking. Uh, yeah. I took him for Uniqlo and various other people as well. Are you sure so you're a barrister? I, I know it's broken <laughs> rights, into intellectual property. That, that's what you specialise in. But I went along to the VNA, and this is the important point: is that what they were trying to say in the whole exhibit is all about comedy, mm. and you knock the people in power. So it's all that's. Boris Johnson there, there's the yeah. Queen Mother there, all in the same ex exhibition. And they're talking about that sort of stuff. And Punch and Judy, which is at, what, 362 years old yes. in this country, and that's what they do. You get the current you know, I get all that, but that the thing is, they, de they deliberately didn't make that the point. I mean, I understand how mm. Punch and Judy, I think, is originally Italian. Yes. Um, and then what they have done uh, in more modern times is they've set the sort of the good guys and the bad guys as politicians in the same way that you get those, um, you know, Guy Fawkes yeah. Yeah. parades yeah. in places like Lewis and they have, you know. But the thing is, they always attack right-wingers. Yes. You know, they never have a left-winger. They're never burning an effigy of Jeremy Corbyn. They're always burning an effigy of Boris Johnson or burning an effigy of Margaret Thatcher. You know, they don't, you know, and I think that... Well, I wonder what they will, if that will change, um, if it has something to do with who's actually in charge. I don't think know. it will because no, I go yeah. back to, I mean, I can't remember... <laughs> Any left-wing leader being yeah. sort of in any way vilified in the same way. Did they ever that... do well, Blair? I wouldn't be surprised if they well, done they Blair did Blair. after Iraq. No, Tony, Tony Blair is in the exhibit. They they have a picture of Private Eye, mm. and they have. But he, Blair is only of... hated now because he's not left-wing enough. Oh, right. you know, he's not hated for being a lefty. He's hated for not being yes. a lefty. But, but they, they did. They and for the Iraq War. And for the Iraq, Iraq War. war yeah. But they didn't put Tony Blair in the sentence with Osama bin Laden and no, Adolf Hitler. That yeah. was reserved for Margaret Thatcher. Well, and that's what's so objectionable. And that's the thing. It's the write-up about the exhibition rather than the exhibition. I think no, but I. I mean, what I, I, yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry go on. Oh, I've, I've never, every time I've been to any exhibition, whether it's a museum or whether it's artwork, I'm always baffled and horrified by how poorly written, mm. the absolute gibberish that they have on the blurb. It's obvious, it's, it's the kind of like meaningless, piffle, yes. Judith Butler language that now has absolutely infested academia these yes. days. And it's... Absolutely, because they can't describe anything, it's can absolutely they? not no. there to illuminate the painting, for no. example. I went to the... Um, the um, Hogarth exhibition at the Tate, I think mm. it was a few yes, years ago, yes. and I could not believe it. it was all about, for example, you could have a wonderful, wonderful series like Mar Marriage a la Mode, one of his most famous um, uh, series of engravings, and um, underneath it would just talk about, for example, how some of the products in, in, the, in these pictures mm. had come from yeah around the world because it was the time of the empire. And I just think well, all the things that you might say yeah. about Marigella Mode, to kind of go in on the fact that the, the hairbrush came from Barbados yes. or whatever, I just thought, right. you guys are really missing the point. They are. Yeah. But like all of these things, whenever they sort of wokeify anything, they take away the truth and they yeah. insert this sort of nebulous, mm. very vague description of everything, which is entirely incorrect mm. yeah. because they can't use the real words. Well, they, they obviously don't love what it is they're describing. Right. It makes me think, well, how are these people end up in charge of mm. our most valuable museums? Yeah. And art galleries, uh -huh. if they fundamentally don't like Hogarth, for example, right. you know, yes. it's like it's like giving like a priceless artwork to like a chimpanzee. Mm. You know, they they don't care about no. the thing. Yeah. We care. But this goes back to care. this goes back to. Sorry, to, I must make this point. <laughs> this goes back to the way that sort of comedians and the BBC, yes. I blame as well, have kind of allowed the vilification of people like Margaret Thatcher. Don't forget, you know, when she was she didn't want the state funeral, but she was given a kind of you know yes. official funeral, and there were people actually booing. People like, I mean, it wasn't a majority Not of people. Not many, but yeah. Not many, but the fact was they were still there. And these are the kind of socialist were, workers, she, scumbags, you know, these kind of people. Have, she would have liked that. She, she would, might she have She would done. have said that, you know, when they've run out of things to talk about, when they go for the mm. personal, it shows they have nothing yes. else to say. She would have seen right. it as a proof of her victory, I think. Exactly. Yeah. But it goes back to, you know, the old jokes. You know, it's all right to, to make a joke about throwing battery acid over Nigel Farage, but you can't say anything about Diane Abbott, you know. Yeah, absolutely. It's ridiculous. It's completely... 
you know, yeah. lopsided anyway, sorry. Well, so the, these curators don't like the art and they don't mm. like us. And because they don't like the art, I don't like going to art galleries anymore. Yeah. Mm. So after COVID, after the lockdowns ended, I thought, great, we can get back out to museums and National Trust and art galleries. And I detested it. Mm. First of all, you started to book on a timed entry, which was just a bore and took all the spontaneity and joy out yes. of visits. But then all the notes had changed. Mm. It's part of this inclusivity yeah. ethics thing that comes from the mm. International Council of Museums. Went to the Rossetti exhibition last year at Tate Britain. And I, it's, it's hard to imagine how they could spoil a Rossetti exhibition, but they had. It was the same mm. thing. Mm. You know, where there were black faces in paintings, there had to be lots of self-flagellating about the empire and slavery. Right. Did they have trigger warnings as well? And, and the very last picture you saw on the way out was they'd, they'd picked some um, kind of... It was, a, it was a photograph of two men kissing, which was supposed to be in the style of Rossetti. And mm. I thought, why would you make that the last image you see? Right. Not that I've got any problem with men kissing, obviously, <laughs> but it was so peripheral to an exhibition yeah. about Rossetti. They just had to, they just had to insert something yes. that was LGBT mm. into it. And every exhibition now is like that. Yeah. Yeah. And they've, they've taken all of the joy and the pleasure and the um, pride right. in, in art yeah. away. Because they're ashamed of it. That's the bottom yeah. line. Well, that's isn't the problem. It? If you're curating, but you're curating the message. And I think th this is the, the difficulty is you're turning around. Comedy is always about taking the mickey out of people. But it and should so be. And, so forth. and it should be. Yeah. I'm, I'm, quite, I'm, I'm quite happy with brutal comedy. I, I don't mind that. And interestingly, that I, object to it, I object to it being ideologically and based. That's the point. But also within the same exhibition, they, they talked about Queen Victoria, who was bossy and big bottomed. And also they had Queen Elizabeth II, our dear late queen, is depicted as a nutcracker. Pun right. intended. Can is you what imagine you put down calling there. Michelle Obama big bottom? They, they, exactly. Is. There you go. But they'd never say it. No, they wouldn't say that. But and this I don't is what really care saying. whether she is or not. But they'd she's never not, say it. She, she's not in the way that Queen Victoria was broader than. I'll she take your. You, I'll take your word on that. I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert. <laughs> on... Michelle Obama looks great, but yeah. She's but got you a big make bottom. you make a valid point. You would not be able to say that about a black woman in an no. exhibition. You wouldn't. But you could because it would be shut down. And you would be, you know, they would be on, you know, on the front page of the Guardian. Yes, Grace. You know, people would be hounded out of town. Aren't we being a bit snowflakey about satire? Maybe. I mean, yeah. isn't it? Isn't it? That's part of the the British comic. Yeah, but as I say, I'm not. I'm not against the satire. I'm no, not no, against we... people being horrible about Margaret Thatcher at all. Yeah. I'm just, uh, I just object to the fact that it's so one sided. No, you're, you're absolutely. Sat George satire. Carlin made the point that uh, the secret of comedy, knowing where the line is right. and going beyond it. Well, Steve Martin said comedy is not pretty, and it shouldn't yeah, be. It should. It, be. it should be brutal. It should be yeah. absolutely savage. But you're not allowed to be savage. But it should be blind. Ricky Gervais to does it because yeah. he can—he's so true. rich he doesn't care. But, but, <laughs> but look, I mean, even he's being disowned now by the lefty <laughs> sort of—you know—people like what's his name, Doucette. What's his name? Um, that that guy, BBC left-wing comedian, uh, Lysette. Yes. Joe Lysette. Oh, yeah. Joe Lysette. Who's, who said, you know, oh, no, Ricky Gervais is just getting lazy he, now. He's, he's attacking minorities. And you're like, he's not well, attacking minorities. He's, being he, funny. He's, he's attacking the bigotry. So you're not, yeah, you're not allowed to, to yeah. make jokes about things which apparently are yeah. sensitive. No, but, no, but I, his point is he's not... He's, this story go for it. isn't yeah. about the satire. Exactly. No. Satire should be savage. Yes. Yeah. Art can be political and yes. polarising. The curation of it That's the point. should not be. Exactly. It's That's the right the up. You're it's absolutely the, right. It's the museum, it's the managers, it's the curators, it's those horrible, annoying little plaques mm. next to the I, pieces. And I did, the, I did ask... And the dimwits who are writing the blurbs. Yeah, yeah exactly. The, the I did ask the VNA. I, I said to them, I said we're coming on your brilliant programme tonight. Yes. They said they never miss they an episode. They throw you out then. <laughs> they always throw me out. <laughs> but I, I did ask, look, look let so. me know um, beforehand. Yes. The person I spoke to said, look, we're just trying to curate. This is about comedy. I wanted somebody officially to talk about how they'd written it up. But it's how they've written it up which is the issue. Yeah. And, and the thing about Ricky Gervais is he's not trying to um, offend the people he's no, offending. No, I think he he's I hope he is. He's hi no, he's highlighting the bigotry towards the people, and that's the point. It's a different focus. And I think what's happened here, the blurb which we've had about putting Maggie Thatcher together with these other appalling people it is basically the wrong blurb. Yeah. Highlighting comedy and attacking public figures mm. is what comedy is all about. Yeah. And punch to his credit and, and his say, and everything it's, else. Is... Again, it's about, it's about the kind of the unfair sort of bias, I suppose. Yes. Yeah. Because you get kids now coming through school, and if you ask them about Margaret Thatcher, who they've never seen, they've yes. never lived under, they will say, oh, yeah, that's the evil, horrible woman. But the villain, know, yes. Who took everybody's milk away. Yeah. You know, I actually remember when she did it, I was very pleased she did it, because I hated the milk. Thatcher the milk snatcher, <laughs> or whatever yeah. it was, yes. Thatcher when she was education minister. Yeah. You know, but anyway, let's talk about um, something else which is equally irksome. The BBC once again urged yes. to get rid of, uh, or at least to suspend, these two employees from BBC Arabic who have been reported since October the 7th. I can't believe they haven't been suspended yet. Um, but this time a, a Tory MP has said, you know, can we not 
actually suspend these two. The BBC has now become Ooh. a sort of, uh, I don't know, a kind of a watch place for, for anti-Semitism. It, it, it's extraordinary. You, you would think that the reason history repeats itself is because we, they don't learn the lessons from history. Mm. And how often do they sort of turn around and say, look, there's a problem here. How quickly have you dealt with it? And yet again, this is going to come up. And we were discussing earlier in the break, this is not going to be the only two people. There's going to be lots of people. If you look at how, who they've retweeted, look at the posts that they've yeah. made within the BBC, huge organisation, right. there's going to be many more issues. Well, not got... just in their basic news coverage, yeah. such as when they reported that Israel had bombed a hospital in Gaza. Yeah. And actually, it was a Gaza misfired rocket. Right. They immediately believed the word of Hamas every time over casualties. I mean, And that goes on all the time. Not all the time. They refused to call Hamas terrorists as well. They were a long time. They were dragged kicking. Kicking and screaming. Well, they still into don't. Calling them a they now say, they, but they now say they are prescribed terrorists. They, they wouldn't yeah. Yeah, say that. They before. give it the long moniker yeah. rather than just say that they're terrorists. Yeah. So that that um, pro Hamas bias is, I'd say, sedimented throughout all of their news coverage. And those those two have only become apparent because the tweets they liked and the tweets they wrote, one of them actually mm. wrote that Israel is a yeah. terrorist yeah. apartheid state. Yeah. So it's not just a question of liking something by yes. mistake. They oh, no. actively written Well, they were things. also liking the celebrations and the dancing that was going on in Tunisia, yes. in Lebanon, yeah. uh, and in and the Gaza Strip, as I said earlier on the show. You know, those images of, of the, the young women being paraded through Gaza where people were uh, spitting on them. Yeah, you know, they were liking all that kind of stuff. And that's... You know what's interesting? I just found this out the other day. I don't know if you know a guy called Malcolm Ballon. Yeah. Uh, Malcolm Ballon was commissioned in 2003-04 by the BBC to do a proper investigation into anti-Semitism at the BBC. And it's never been published. Oh, wow. it, it's a waiting publication. Wow. I'm going to start picking up on this story because I got this from somebody the other day. Um, BBC's line was it wouldn't be fair to publish it because the people who spoke to the, serve, the study were uh, assured of their confidentiality. Mm. But oh. so it's quite a big deal, this, I think, and I'm going to be looking into it. Um, but basically investigated hundreds and hundreds of hours of footage, wrote a 20,000-word report. Yes. Nobody's ever seen it. Well, they can remain anonymous. It's not the first time you've had somebody... Not well, the in. government are very good at redacting yeah. reports. Well, I mean. exactly, exactly. No, you need to look at... Well, there's a couple of warnings as well, and we, we talked about this, is when they deliberately do this and make the posts, then absolutely call it out. People, however, a bit slap dash sometimes mm. about what they like and what they retweet. They will all come back yeah, to bite no, them. but there's no issue with that here, because... You, no, they, they absolutely were very clear what their views sure are. that that is what's been going on. Yeah. And didn't BBC Verify also verify mm. a story where um, they claimed that Israeli soldiers had shot Palestinians mm. taking aid off a truck? Yes. And it turned out that it was Hamas yes. shooting Palestinians right. taking aid and off also, a truck. And, and so, all of the sources for the story that they used were all pro-Palestinian in one way, shape or form. Pro-Palestinian journalists or, 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 or Hamas, or, Hamas or, operatives. Yeah. operatives on the yes. ground. Yeah. So, um, as somebody I saw wrote um, about this, BBC Verify couldn't verify a tomato. So that kind of bias is, is obviously embedded throughout the organisation. Didn't some BBC Jewish employees also speak off the record, I think it was to the Telegraph, mm -hmm. about how they found the anti-Semitism yeah. in yes. the organisation untenable? Very uncomfortable place to work if you're, if you're Jewish, they said, which is extraordinary. And it was only a few weeks ago as well they sacked that woman from BBC Three, uh, if you remember, who was mm. posting some horrific stuff on right. Facebook under her own name. Mm. Yeah. She was like a sort of talent booker for BBC Three. Mm. And, you know, to be fair to the BBC, at least they did fire her. Yes. But they but they didn't do anything about it until it was brought to their attention. And this is the problem. I say history's repeating itself yeah. because they don't learn the lessons. And they've got... I won't say about trust going in. No, I won't you've been banned from saying that. <laughs> it's the wonderful phrase I always <laughs> say, but, it, but it's true. Yeah. And the reason it becomes so true is because that's what happens. Mm. So they need to learn the lessons. They need to root it out really quickly. But there will be more and more examples. We can predict there will be more and more of these hitting the headlines again. Yes, exactly right. Bit of royal stuff before we head... Uh, towards the papers. And I will show you again the uh, the Kate and Wills walking around yes. the, the Windsor farm shop. But before that, there's another story. Harry and Meghan have apparently been officially downgraded Saw that. from oh. um, the Buckingham Palace website. They used to have 4,000-word individual profiles. They've now vanished and been replaced by shorter 500-word ones next to Prince Andrew. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it is extraordinary. What do you make of that? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what's also extraordinary is why that story was leaked, because obviously somebody from within the PR machine, the, the self Well, somebody would have just noticed that, it. I mean, well, there are people that check... I, I, I no, I trust me, there are people yeah? in Fleet Street that check royal websites literally by the hour. You don't think they were briefed? Uh, no. Uh, OK. No, because there are people who look for royal websites, royal 
little sort of yes. you know, nuances. Ah, oh, yes, but the Royal Bernard machine, knowing that happens, might have done it deliberately. That, that's, so, that's my point, So yeah. Andrew could be right anyway. My job to be right. Oh, you see what you mean, <laughs> that, that they've Bjorn, changed it at this time. The Royal yes. machine hasn't exactly been firing no. all, all no. cylinders, no. Really, no. has it? Well, this is the trouble. I mean, the footage that we're, we'll see of, of William and Kate walking around this, this farm yeah. has already caused lots of people to say, oh, that's definitely not her. So, I mean, it won't make it all go away, will it? Well, you know, until they do something official. People have official. gone mad about that. They have. Yeah. They have well, gone here's the footage. Mad. Here's yes, the look footage at this. here. I mean, she does look a bit thinner because she's been recovering from... But she's carrying a very large bag. But she's walking, you know, very, quite briskly, very carrying a bag. It's a huge bag. But, of course, you know, once you get the madness... Not that huge. No, the, no, it's not that huge. But, I mean, once you get this madness, there's no escape from it, is there? But that, that's it's... the problem. The role of photography feed, and work on that basis. can't feed the well. madness. Maybe they should just do nothing. Well, it's like the, this is like an acceptable conspiracy theory mm. now. A lot of yeah. otherwise sensible people are genuinely speculating yeah. about some of the mad possibilities out I'm, there. Members of my family are calling me from America and going, oh, you know, yeah. what's oh. happening? Yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah. Going, the Americans especially. Yeah, the Americans have gone uh, in sentence. Uh, uh, all the regular news shows are actually covering ab it absolutely. as if it's an event. Yeah, and, well, and it's yeah. not just America. I, mean, I, I was speaking to people in Japan uh, this morning, saying sort of, it's hit global headlines. And the problem is this, is that if you look back, lots of these things are, are photoshopped. You have a look at the Christmas card, which went yeah. last year. There are too many fingers, there are too many legs. You have the Queen picture with all her great-grandchildren, grandchildren. There's people have been smiling that that's wrong as well. You have the picture of... Uh, I mean, but nobody's ever noticed Sophie. it before. Though. Well, that's no, what's happening. Go have, back now. They have, they have noticed it. There's been a number of cases of Photoshop that were picked up. Famously, one I really remember was um, Prince William being accused of having had an airbrushed hair transplant mm. oh, in one yeah. of his portraits. Right. Yes. No, there, are, there are loads I of don't them. remember and any of these, there's, though. There's no way that um, all of these portraits, all the kids and, and, and Queen Elizabeth are all looking at the camera at the same time. But this is not a new thing. Mm. Queen Elizabeth I's coronation portrait taken by yes. um, Beaton was supposed to be in Westminster. It wasn't. It was taken by Buckingham Palace with a Absolutely. with a cloth backdrop of mm. Westminster. You're right. Image manipulation is nothing new. They and just Cecil did a really, Beaton, exactly. a really bad job of it this time. Well, that's the trouble. Mm. It was awful. And yeah. there was no reason to put but, it out but, but also, because it was that awful. But there was no ill intent. And, and, and the key to this is not as though she was deep sea diving or hang gliding or whatever. She was sitting in a chair and tried to make the photo look as good as possible mm. with the children. It was an appalling and photo failed job. And failed miserably. Well, it, it was a, and she didn't have the ring and the leaves were too... I mean, if she was a politician, so which obviously she isn't, yeah. you would be giving her absolutely seven bells of all sorts of terrible things. Well, it, well, what, but you interest, forgive her because she's yeah, not... I, I think you should forgive her. And I'll tell you what, we should leave Kate alone. But also... What What's interesting is part of the narrative behind all of that. When the photo first came out, it was Prince William who was credited as having taken yeah. it. All of a sudden, when the people started putting this kill notice, it suddenly became Catherine who had to do the apologies and everything yeah. else. So I'm not sure what's going on behind the well, scenes. Well, she said she was the one that manipulated that's well, why. Which is probably... But, and so what? I mean, photos are manipulated all the time. You look well, at again, Sophie none of that would side. matter apart from what went before. Yes. It's, it's the whole and scenario. The, the, the real question is, did she look as well as that? As I say, she wasn't hang gliding, she's not deep sea diving, she's not leaping up in the air and doing somersaults. Uh, it really is her sitting there with that sort of family. It's an appalling Photoshop job, but it's not the first time in history, as you say, Cecil Beaton used to famously well, we'll do that. we'll see whether or not it gets them off the hook. Unfortunately, people are fascinated by this stuff and it's not going to go away. It, release it the will. first, release it the will photo. Go away. As she comes back, they, they shouldn't have to release the photo and yes. they won't be able to because there won't be a picture with all the kids mm. in at the same time, yeah. probably. <laughs> That's the problem. No. Um, but it, it, the story will go away because mm. she'll return to her duties. Yeah. yeah. Or I would, I would say as well, a lot of yeah. this, okay. a lot of this kind of nastiness has, has been generated by the ridiculous kind of, you know, Toing and froing between Harry and Meghan yes. and William and yeah. Kate because there's now two teams no. out there on and, social media. And they're all briefing each other. And some Americans who who got rid of their monarchy and yeah. slightly envious of ours. I think. Yes, exactly. I mean, I said this earlier in, uh, last week. I think when I was working in America in the 80s. I mean, some of the stuff that they published in those days in things like the National Enquirer and yeah. the Globe and the Weekly World News were just ludicrous. But because it was America and they were supermarket tabloids. People just ate it up and read it and loved it and thought it was all true. Yeah. You know, chuck and die, it was always about, you know. Uh, it's just ridiculous. And it sells, in it a, sells. In a weird way, I think it does suggest that there is some kind of, like, very strong residual soft power in all of this. Mm. The fact that friends of mine from all over the world keep getting in touch and being like, what's going on yeah. with the Kate photo? I mean, there's nothing else... Certainly, there no. are very few politicians in the world that command exactly this level right. of interest. Yeah, exactly right. So, in a way, it's actually boosted the royal <laughs> well, family. I don't know about that. I think it has. It does show that it, there is an abiding in, uh, in this institution that we're often told is completely irrelevant in this day and age. Mm, absolutely right. Anyway, listen, you're watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Coming up next, uh, the bore of Banksy's new bureau. And, of course, 
All the best of tomorrow's news in the papers. Stay exactly where you are. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And you're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Hey, Quite hey. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, miss it. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, yeah. minutes, four... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, it put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 what did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. You're watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Now, it's time for this. The World of Woke. It had to be Islington, didn't it? The site of the latest piece of art by the supposedly upper-crust revolutionary Banksy. Done to make it look like a Just Stop Oil protest, it's got it all, apparently. Even a picture of Jeremy Corbyn walking past to have a look. Um, but really... What is the point? Champagne socialists and socialist workers have united in rapture at the amazing work, which looks like someone has thrown a lot of green paint at a wall alongside a caricature of a protester holding a pressure hose next to it. Locals are purring about how proud and delighted it's made them. One of sellers said, it felt like a personal message to us. We just feel so proud. Banksy expert James Peake said, the message is clear, nature's struggling and it's up to us to help it grow back. They're all excited, you see, because the wall in question has an old tree just in front of it and the green paint is supposed to signify actual leaves, even though it clearly doesn't. A pathetic, straw-clutching piece of behaviour. They also love that it is the exact same shade of green used by Islington Council for signs in the area. How cool. Of course, some of the residents are hoping that it might make their properties more valuable. Those would be the socialists who don't like money. Those living in poverty in social housing are more concerned that their rents might go up as a result. The owner of the building, one Alex Giorgio, said he won't put any rents up, but he would sell the whole building to the highest bidder if he's made a generous enough offer. The bottom line is that the mural, whether you like it or not, is very much a symbol of why Britain is broken. 
The trendies are all bowled over by what is effectively a bit of graffiti behind a dead tree. It doesn't signify growth or nature or anything, really. In fact, it might rather ironically result in the eviction of the people living there. The inclusion of one of the eco-nutters in the picture rather gives away Banksy's leanings. And if he thinks those morons are worthy of art, he's in a worse place than I thought. Perhaps they could come and throw a load of paint over it. Oh, podcast presenter Sally Flatman rushed down to see it after hearing about it on the radio. To me, it speaks about how precious green spaces are and how we need more of them in our urban areas. Heaven preserve us, is all I'll say. The world of woke. So, the panel are back with me. Uh, we are here with Madeline, with Laura, uh, and with Andrew. Um, the latest Banksy, I'm afraid no Banksy really does it for me. I'm, you know, it just looks like somebody's thrown a load of paint over a wall. I'm sorry if that makes me a Philistine. <laughs> it's not really no, art to me. It's horrible. Yeah. It's horrible. Just and there are all these people trees. going, but it's behind this tree, and the tree is actually dying, right? Yes. So the council have already said we're not going to be able to spend much more money <clears> on keeping it alive. And if you look really, really from far away and you squint your eyes, it looks like it's got green leaves. It doesn't. I'm sorry, it doesn't. I'm surprised it's still there, because the last time Banksy allegedly did something, it, somebody went in the middle of the night mm. and chipped it away, because yeah, yeah. it's worth a well, fortune. Well, it's quite big. I think you'd, you'd need <laughs> Take a little bit lorries to, yeah. to chip it away and take it, you know. I but, did like that one that he had where it self-shredded. Yes. Oh, right after it was sold. Yes. Yeah. That was proper. <laughs> now that is that was, no, that's that was funny. Proper Empress New. That Coast. is funny. And it increased it? in value as a result, didn't it? Is what they said. Yeah. The well, except it didn't exist. Yeah. Let's talk about the big story of the night. There's a new James Bond in town. Yes. Um, now people have been talking about this for a long time. The Sun have got an exclusive in which they say uh, that a man that you've heard of and I haven't really, Alan Taylor, Aaron Taylor Johnson, who yeah. I've never heard of. I mean, I know this is going to sound terrible, but what's he been in? He was in. Um, Nowhere Boy, I think where he plays a young John Lennon okay. and um, uh, women of my vintage will remember him from Angus Thongs and Perfect Snogging. Okay, so um, I've never seen which that. Which is a classic chick flick. Okay. Um, but to be honest, he mostly plays, and I think he's also in the Kingsman films, which is a kind of spice booth. Yes. So I've seen one of those yeah, yeah, but yeah. without I very much enthusiasm. The, I think he was in one of those, but but he's more, almost more of a, a character actor. Yeah. And he's he's quite, he's he's. He's young too. He's thirty-three. He's thirty-three. It's and he's married, married to a director clearly. who's yeah. twenty-three years older than him. Good luck to him. There you clearly, go. Clearly, they wanted to have somebody who could possibly do it for quite a long time. Mm. You know, they want to have someone who could conceivably do it for right. another fifteen years or something. Yes. But I don't know if it's if it's confirmed. He's been he's been offered the role. He's been offered the role. Um, yes. Yeah, so. And I think he had. It was rumored that he. I think he went to the head of the book uh, the betting odds recently because mm. he was said to have had a very successful meeting with. Barbara Broccoli. Oh, yeah. I just want to I don't know if he'll be good or bad. I'm a big, big fan of Bond. Like, for me, the big criteria, I just long to know, is he a fan of Bond? Yes. Because I feel like for a long time, want. the people who've been in charge of the franchise, mm. the, some of the directors who've done it recently, seem to absolutely despise Bond. Mm. They spend all their pro interviews, promotional interviews, just slagging off, like, right. Sean Connery, Bond, yeah. and yes. that kind of thing. And I just exactly. think... It's a bit like we were saying with the museums. Why yeah. do these wonderful institutions keep being given to people yeah. who fundamentally hate them? It's more about them, isn't it? It's yeah. like, I'm yeah. directing a Bond film, so I'll make it in my oh. own image. What yeah. ideology can I squeeze in? I yeah. just can't I can't believe what they did with Bond by the end. <gasps> I know. Are we allowed to not, say it? I'm not or is sure. it still not, not something? Sure. No, I don't think I want to spoil it for them. Probably not. I think everybody's <laughs> seen it who's going to see it. After <laughs> killing they kill off. him. They kill yeah, him. He's dead at the end. <laughs> oh, yeah. no, no, and he has a horrible child. <laughs> <laughs> after killing him off at the end, I'm not sure I can watch another Bond film. But sort of... I might have watched another Bond film if it's if Henry Cavill is Bond. No, I think see. he would make he would make a perfect James Bond. Yeah. I'd watch James Bond for Henry Cavill in the yeah. world. But I, I, I'll have to be really convinced, like you, that they like Bond and they're not going to kill him off. I'll tell, you what, I'll tell you one thing. I don't think anybody's made any money on this. I don't know mm. anybody who put Aaron in the frame before today. Really? And the interesting... He looks like a comedy James Bond, doesn't well, he? I think he's got more of a comedy this also, sort of look this about him. This also yeah, does away with my, good, my theory. very good odds on him. Yeah, my theory, you see, was that they wouldn't... Because I said this to, to my kids. Yes. You don't actually see him dying. Yes. So I said, you know, it's possible they'll bring him back. Yes. And they'll say, actually... That didn't happen. You know, yes, he was terribly badly injured. Yes, there was a big explosion. <laughs> right. but amazingly, well, no. they did it in Dallas, didn't they? Well, yes. he'll, he'll oh, have... Bobby you in the shower. Do, yeah. You remember that? Bobby the dream Ewan. sequence, absolutely. Yeah. If they bring him back and he's, you know, been terribly badly injured, then he'll be basically like... Blofeld after his yes, injury, yes. like in a wheelchair. Like, I'm not sure you can have two of those. No, <laughs> that's true. Or indeed the seduction. But it's good. I mean, we talk about different. the royal family still being, you know, part yes. of the news cycle. I'm glad to see that James Bond is still part of the news. Oh, they love it. You know, but unfortunately, as you say, now it's more about who's singing the song yes. and who's directing it. 
I, I thought they were very clever last time because they, they everybody talked about having a, a woman being uh, James Bond, and actually what they well, did, they had, they had a woman, had a woman as 007. 007. She was good. That was a clever, yeah. absolutely very clever way of doing it. That she couldn't but be James, James Bond. Bond can't be a woman. No, <laughs> no, but, Just but can't. can be 007 is, is their point. Yeah. And that's well, we'll mean. look forward to it. Um, the other story, uh, by the way, I'm just told that apparently nine of the ten. Um, amendments of no Hurrah! Rejected. Have they all been thrown They've out? They've all been thrown out. So I, I, I want the one where they say you have to abide by the law. Yes. And throw that one out. I think that was That'd the be first glorious. one. <laughs> they threw I it think out. That was the first one. <laughs> now let's talk about diets because the Metro yes. has got a story about celebrity sixteen eight fast. Yes, risk, very good for you. Doubles the risk of dying, according oh, to. Oh, does it? Well, <laughs> uh, so actually, it's not oh, very good for you. So if you're doing that, uh, you've got to double the risk of dying. <laughs> I don't even know what it is, but I presume so it's, it's one of these ones eight hours on, 16 yeah, hours eat off. For or eight hours, not eat for 16. I mean, the, thing, the thing about this, does it double your risk of dying? I don't know. I mean, the idea of doing this sounds... Well, living weird. doubles your risk of dying, it's, yes, <laughs> basically. It sounds like a torturous diet, but often the methodology around these diets, and as they're reported, is very right. flaky. Also, very flaky call me old-fashioned, but is it not normal to sort of eat for, I don't know, more like say, four hours? rather than If you're eating for eight hours, I don't think you're going to lose any weight. No, but that's the no. window that you're allowed to eat in. Oh, I see. Oh, you're not eating solidly for eight yeah, hours. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is, I'll have four this is why I'm not good at this stuff, you know. <laughs> Give me, I've got another seven hours to go. Yeah, like, the, you know. like, the idea, <laughs> like the Brian Butterfield diet. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Well, the idea yeah. is that your body can recuperate, and that, that's so you have a big period of time. Mm. So you're eight hours you, you eat in that sort of sensible way. My then, problem with diets yeah. is drinking. I just think that... Oh, yeah. I've never yet found a yeah. diet that you can drink in. Well, actually, you know, there have been studies, proper robust ones, that show that if you switch your calories from food to alcohol, you don't gain any weight. In fact, you lose weight. Really? So you well, have that's not been diet. my experience. I don't know why I'm not, I'm not a size eight then. <laughs> I, I, when I was in America, before I got married, my fiancé made me go on a diet. Yeah. It's 1,500 calories a day, which, as I worked out, was only three vodka and grapefruit juice. Oh, is that, so that's, <laughs> is so that, that right? Was, that was what I did. I how many, how many units are in your juice. vodka? Yeah. These are how, American how much, measures. Uh, there were about that much vodka in each glass. So well, I mean, there was, it took me a long time to get used to English measures when I came back. Well, the, Ten years were, of that. Uh, I, I think you're, you're right. There's a lot of uh, calories in, in alcohol. You're absolutely right. What, what was interesting about the study, there's 20,000 people, and they said there was 91% more likely to have cardiovascular issues right. as a result of going on the Jennifer diet. Jennifer Aniston apparently yeah, likes this diet. You, you have to look at what they're eating as yes. well. Like, yeah. maybe they're eating a lot of seed oils and Maybe they misunderstood the eight hours. Or, or maybe they're eating yes. vegan also, food. They could be eating other also, foods that aren't actually good for also, you. Also, I'm sorry, but... If you're comparing people who've gone on a diet with people who eat normally, it's possible that the people who are on the diet are on it because they're overweight. In yes, which case, it's yes. not a very good control right. group, is it? I actually heard somebody the other day saying that they wanted to put some weight on so that they would qualify for these fat injections. Oh, is that right? For the, 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 like, Govi. Isn't that Govi. kind of defeating the object? Which you're going to put weight on so that yes. the doctor will give you them. Why don't you just stay I, as I you think, are? I think it's quite good logic, actually. Because <laughs> you have to be a certain weight to qualify. Yeah, there's other way I give people, it to you. And eating is fun. So you're right. like, I can have a great month of picking out and then I can just, it will just drop off me. But, but, really? but the, the I, trouble yeah. is with, with it's a new It's a new theory. We yeah. could go with that, but we're out of time. <laughs> out, out of time. Thank you, guys. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Thank That's you. all from me tonight. You've been watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Uh, thank you to Madden. Thank you to Laura. Thank you to Andrew. I'll see you all tomorrow at 8pm after Just the Poil have been ridden from the country, hopefully, only on Talk TV. See you then. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking <laughs> and screaming. I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. 
What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh. Ooh. It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. 